John 18, verse 33. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this of, on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to you, to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? A word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Mesmerized by 
prosperity beyond our perceivable capability. I don't know, maybe we want to be admired, if only briefly, you know, the kind of admiration people has for those people. Those people who make us take notice. I also think, because we think this way, it's no mistake that the person who sits at the head of our government comes from that kind of large, gilded existence. One of the rich and famous, whose wealth bolsters a mythical bootstrap meritocracy, believing that you get there just by your merit alone. A person whose name displayed on tall buildings offer a potent symbol of glory and pride and worthiness, displaying to the world a certainty and permanence. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing inherently wrong with all these symbols of wealth and objects of our attention. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy or having status or belonging. In fact, often there is something to marvel at. But as awe-inspiring as those things might be, none of those man-made monuments really give us what we desire. Because we often get it so wrong, worshiping the gifts of God rather than the gift giver who is God. And I think perhaps that's what this little tricky passage is about. In times of confusion and challenge and distress, it's easy to get caught up and will be overly impressed by the symbols of power around us and not pay attention to the thing behind the thing and not know that this too shall pass and not know that God is still at work. So in today's scripture, we see the disciples looking in awe at the splendor of the temple, a building meant to display religious glory, pride, and worthiness, a building meant to display the power of God, even the presence of God. According to the first century historian Josephus, the Jerusalem temple of Jesus' day was awe-inspiring. Newly constructed by Herod the Great, the temple's retaining walls were composed of stones 40 feet long. The temple itself occupied a platform twice as large as the Roman Forum and four times as large as the Athenian Acropolis. Herod reportedly used so much gold to cover the outside of the building that anyone who gazed at them in bright sunlight risked blinding themselves. I mean, it had to be amazing to see. So the disciple in this story is so impressed, he tries to share his sense of awe with Jesus. But Jesus isn't dazzled. So when the disciple says, do you see these great buildings? Why does Jesus ask the disciple, if you can see these great buildings? I mean, aren't they both looking at the same thing? They are not. They're not seeing the same thing at all. But what does Jesus see that the disciples don't see? The disciple sees the power and the permanence of this massive structure. But Jesus sees fragility. For he understood that Herod the Great 
was a ruthless and cruel leader. He knew, he knew about the people he crushed in order to build that. There had been a hundred year war before this period between the Jewish royals and the Roman aristocracy. And Jesus' people had lost and Herod won. But the people were not happy. And the rebellion was still there, right underneath the surface. This was a cruel and insecure leader. But the disciple looks at what he has built and sees magnificence. But Jesus sees loss. Because national temples were to appeal to the sensibilities of the population, but I would dare to say they served the interest of the ruler more. I believe Jesus saw the loss of religious practice as the strength of the regional religious leadership that could have benefited his people so much more. The disciples saw the ultimate symbol of the status quo. But Jesus looks at the same thing and sees change. He responds, not one stone will be left here upon another. And the disciple is stunned. For Jesus invites them to look beyond the grandeur of the temple and recognize the taxes levied on the poor that it took to build it. He invites them to look beyond the golden gleam of the temple and recognize the inconsistency of a ruler who would exploit the people under his rule and then pay homage to God. He invites them to look beyond the grandeur of the temple and recognize that God's forces through nature would bring all this to an end. Inviting them to consider that God is not bound by mortar and stone, but rather by justice, mercy, and compassion. And God is not impressed by the biggest, the newest, or the shiniest. What large stones and what large buildings, says the disciple. Jesus says, you're impressed by this grandiose architecture? There's not a stone in the whole world that is not going to just end up in a heap of rubble. In this story, I put myself in the disciples' place, Listen, listening to this strange talk in bewilderment as Jesus pops my little bubble. <coughs> Here are the questions I find myself asking. What lies and illusions do I mistake for the truth? And why is it so easy for me to cling to permanence when Jesus is always asking me to evolve? Am I willing to sit with the fact that things fall apart? Things I love, things I built, even things I've cried and prayed and worked so hard for. Can I embrace a journey of faith that includes rubble, things breaking down, things that get ruined and failure? The Bible says later as he was sitting on the Mount Olives and 
full view of the temple, James, John, and Andrew got him off by himself and said, well, okay, so tell us, when is this going to happen? When is all this stuff going to crumble? What sign will we have that all this grandeur was, is coming to an end? And now here's the most important part of the text for me. Jesus answers, watch out for doomsday deceivers. Many leaders are going to show up with forged identities claiming, I'm the one. That's the sign. And they will deceive a lot of people. Watch out for those predicting the end of the world, claiming I'm the one to protect you. Watch out for the ones preaching invasion, claiming I'm the one to hold back the tide. Watch out for those professing to be the moral majority, claiming I'm the one to protect the faith. Jesus says, watch out for the doomsday deceivers. They will deceive a lot of people. And then Jesus goes on to say, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, keep your head, don't panic. This is routine history. And that is not the sign of the end. Nation will fight nation and ruler will fight ruler over and over. Earthquakes will occur in various places. There will be famines. But these things are nothing compared to what's coming. Wow, that's a real challenge of this text. That's the real challenge of the gospel. For it does appear as though the world is going to end itself. Because we are living in a perilous time. We are living with so much uncertainty. There are so many false prophets and people proclaiming doom. But here we're told not to panic. Keep our heads about us because something is about to happen. For many of us, this has been an emotionally and spiritually exhausting week. Just look at the daily news. What we see is scarier than any horror movie we can imagine. In California, thousands of acres of land burning for massive wildfires. Entire neighborhoods reduced to nothing but ashes. So many lives lost. Elsewhere, families are mourning in the aftermath of yet another mass shooting. Or starving in the shadow of a relentless war, or continuing to recover from hurricane damage, or suffering religious persecution, people shot up again in a house of worship, or suffering racial violence while yet another black man, this time a security officer, shot dead by the police himself being a secure. And then we see images of so many attempting to cross a national border because the horrors they leave behind are worse than the dangers in front of them. <coughs> this is a troubling time and it's easy to despair or to just be numb by it all or to be exhausted by it all. But here we are told, before things get better, before we marvel at things which will pass away, you will hear and you will see terrible.
terrifying things. And these terrible things will happen as they do in the course of human history. But all that and all of this is nothing compared to what's coming. For in the midst of all of this, something is struggling to be born. Hope, peace, justice, reconciliation. And in the process of this, this new thing trying to be born, what we thought was permanent will pass away. In the process, what we thought was so impressive will turn out to be foolishness. What we thought was rich and empowering will turn out to be just empty. By telling us to be watchful and not be alarmed, Jesus is warning us not to let our imaginations get the best of us. But we can't live in the what if of the future. But we have to live in the now. And things like wars and false messiahs and earthquakes and famines and persecution are like the contractions of a woman in labor, not signs that the end is near. And it is scary and it is painful. Yes, birthing is ugly, painful, and bloody. It hurts so much. It's so hard. But here, God is our midwife. And the feminine face of God is beside us to hold our hand as this, this new thing is trying to be born. To help us breathe through the pain. To help us bring something new into the world and what God will birth will never lead us to desolation. Yes, we are called to bear witness in the ruins. But here we are told, rest assured, these birth pains will end in joy. <coughs> Just like when a mother goes through all of that and then magically when that new life presents itself, it's almost forgotten, the hardship. Because the possibility, the tenderness before her is attractive. That's why we say, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. That's why we sing hymns of struggle and conflict, like God of grace and God of glory. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days. That's why we sing, we shall not give up the fight. That's why we sing a mighty fortress is not the building, a mighty fortress is our God. When evil powers last in rage and swear and threaten mass destruction, when we are tempted to despair and yield to their seduction, then may we stand assured by God's most holy word, the evil one shall fail. God's righteousness prevail. So people of God, don't look to things made of silver and gold or even mortar and stone. Don't look to CNN. Don't look to the gleaming monuments. Don't look to those who broker fear. Here we are told, be encouraged. Be strengthened. Look to the Lord from which comes our help. Look for signs of birth. Look for signs of 